Hey, welcome to Ham Nation. You're here just in time. We have got an amazing take on the Pine Board Project from W2WJS. It's called the Super Pine Board. Wait until you see this. The craftsmanship is amazing. George picked up a neat little kit at the Huntsville Ham Fest. It's a dummy load with a twist. And speaking of the Huntsville Ham Fest, you've probably heard of the Pearson family and the 10-year-old who won the ICOM 7610. We've got the family live tonight here on Ham Nation. Stick around. It's going to be a great show. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 417 for August 28th, 2019. The W2WJS Super Pine Board. Hello, everybody. K9EID, Bob Heil, and I'm back in Belleville, Illinois, just across the river from St. Louis. And you are watching Ham Nation, and welcome to you. And we also have this on an audio podcast, so we hope everybody's hearing things. And I guarantee you, you're going to learn a lot tonight. And uh, we've got some some wonderful programming. Uh, let's uh, let's see who all is here at first. Uh, we've got Gordo out in the uh, uh, the wonderful West Coast. How you doing, Gordon? Um, All is well here. The uh, waves are still coming in from our hurricane. That's now just a remnant off to the uh, north of us. So all is well, Bob. All right. We'll be right back to you because I know you you have some nice things. Don, how are you doing down there in the uh, the Gulf? I hope you're not going to get any of that hurricane nonsense. How are you doing, Don? Yeah, me too. We're watching that. It's uh, it's still a ways away, but they're saying it may be a Category 3 by the time it gets over by Florida, and hopefully it won't jump over the peninsula and get into the Gulf because we're, uh, uh, we're marking the 14th anniversary of Katrina tomorrow. So uh, I don't mind telling you, it got just a little bit of PSD still about these things, but uh, that's okay. We're not going to worry about that tonight. That's still days and days away. I want to say hello first off to our friends listening at WTWW5085 and uh, – uh, the the big uh, the big one out there in Tennessee and uh, you know you can they take requests uh, go on wtww.us and uh, look at that re- request link and it's uh, it's almost instant almost instant request it's amazing how it works so it's, it's fascinating stuff uh, we've got uh, Dr T with her solar update newsline and we have a very special guest tonight if you were at the Huntsville Ham Fest you saw uh, little Ryan Pearson ten year old Ryan Pearson win. The ICOM 7610. We have the Pearson family live tonight with us a little bit later on after the Newsline segment. So stick around for that. It's it's gonna it's it's a great story. It's a great story, Bob. Back to you. Amazing family. Yeah, really amazing. And George, what's going on in your world? You've been out chasing snakes or transmitters or both? <laughs> well, no. I've tried to. Uh, Stay away from both so far this week. Now, I'm going to the transmitters tomorrow because the temperature is supposed to be a little lower and the humidity is going to be lower. And I just put a tube in one of these transmitters last week. So after 200 hours, it's time for me to turn the filament voltage back down just to where I see the power drop off a little bit and then increase it slightly. And I'll get a lot more life out of that tube doing that. Now, you don't do that with all tubes, but you do with the 4CX15000A. I've got a little project here we're going to show you tonight. This is something I picked up at Huntsville. This is a kit. We'll be talking more about that here in just a few minutes. Okay. Well, um, before we get over to Gordon, I've got a couple of pictures that um, we had from from Huntsville. I didn't run them last week. Looky there. 
It's old Canine ID who's in the chat room all the time and has a wonderful T-shirt shop. He and his his wife, are, I see him at all the ham fest. And I thought that was a, a real cute picture and I forgot to do it last week. And the next one is very special. Uh, Don, you might want to you might want to uh, caption this for us. Yeah, we have Drew Reba, the uh, young ham of the year. We've got uh, Emmett from Radio Waves. We've got uh, representatives from Yezu and also from Gigaparts. Gigaparts uh, was up there as well. Right behind uh, Drew is Richard Moseson from CQ uh, Publishing, and uh, of course Hammy from Ham Talk Live is there. And uh, some dude who makes microphones and uh, some guy who uh, uh, attempts to be a broadcaster <laughs> right behind him. So, yeah, it was a, it was a great time. And Drew is going to be up uh, with me at the Peoria Superfest in September. Uh, also, another of our Newsline staffers, Paul Brown, WD9GCO, he's going to be up there uh, as well uh, at the uh, Peoria Superfest. That is the 21st, I believe it is, of September. So uh, if you're in the Peoria, Illinois area, come by and say hello to us. And you can meet Drew Vreba, the 2019 Young Ham of the Year. Oh, and while I'm here, I, I announced this as we gave the presentation for the Young Ham of the Year. But real quickly, uh, we have uh, started the Amateur Radio Newsline Amateur Radio Club. And I'm pleased to say that as of yesterday, our club call is WA6ITF. Kind of makes the hair stand up on my arm. We've got Bill's call, and we're going to be activating that. Uh, so be listening for that. So brand new uh, Amateur Radio Newsline, Amateur Radio Club from uh, uh, current and former staff members uh, from Amateur Radio Newsline. And we're going to have Bill's call back on the air. And I could not be more proud of that, Bob. Wow. that That's great, Don. Oh, uh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. It's the new voice. Uh, Bob is uh, he's working his magic. But um, uh, in preparation for Bob coming back aboard, we're going to talk about these. And that is the Anderson connectors. And I know, I know we've talked about Anderson's before. We're going to be looking at uh, the Anderson power poles. But before we do, for those on the East Coast, we encourage you to tune in to 7268 for the hurricane net. The hurricane watch net is now active on both 7268 as well as 14. 325, 20 meters and 40 meters. Now, for those that want to tune in and hear the great work that uh, those volunteer hams are doing at the National Hurricane Center for Hurricane Watch, you can tune in 7268 by going to the Web SDR in Orlando, Florida. And that Web SDR address is sdr.november4 bravo uniform tango. Dot com, and uh, you'll hear the 40-meter side of what's happening. And we wish everybody uh, the very best and uh, safe uh, travels as that hurricane <clears throat> travels pretty much uh, uh, headed in our direction. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at Anderson connectors. And uh, we encourage everybody with Andersons that you want to be sure and use the right crimping tool or if you're going to solder them, that's fine. Or if you're going to crimp and solder them, that's okay. But be sure and use the right tools for getting the job done. We had several of the uh, connector uh, boxes turned over to me uh, for, uh, they're giving them away because they're broken. And I said, well, what's broken? And they go, well, my radio is intermittent. Anytime I hook it up to my uh, Anderson connector uh, distribution box, and um, um, you can have it. I'm, I'm tired of fussing with it. And I go, wait, wait, they can be repaired. So if you've got an Anderson uh, connector set up that looks like this, and we'll go to our next slide, <clears throat> and um, you wiggle the connectors as I'm doing right there, and they're loose, then you know that that's where the problem is. It's not your radio. Uh, it's not necessarily the DC uh, going to the DC input on these distribution uh, 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 boxes, but rather it's a bad connection. And if you take a look at one, two, the third one up and the fourth one up, you can see that uh, they pulled right out of the circuit board. And you may say, well, 
you know, I pull the fuses out and, and nothing happens there. And that's because almost all of the Anderson connector distribution block manufacturers do a great job of getting the fuses all squared away. But, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, how many of you, as I've done, have lost a fuse inside the box? Well, if you do, you're going to need to open up the back to get that little pesky fuse out. Don't leave it rolling around on the inside. When you open up the back of your Anderson connector distribution box, on most of them, you immediately see the circuit board that the Anderson connectors are uh, soldered into. And um, all of the manufacturers, I should say almost all of them, uh, the uh, sole holdout would be West Mountain Radio. I have yet to ever have one of those fail. The West Mountain Radio they must weld them into place. But anyway, everybody else uses a small amount of solder to hold the connector points in. And what occurs is when you unplug your unit from the Anderson connector box, you give it a tug. And instead of just coming out, it comes totally out. And that's because the solder has broken off the two pins. And unless there's a ton of solder holding on to the two pins, it's just going to pull right out. There is nothing special about the two pins that go into the uh, holes on the circuit board inside the box. Uh, it looks like just pieces of wire. And as you can see, there's not a lot of solder on them. And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, you can sort of wiggle them around. You're not going to be able to easily solder to the top of the pins. But where you do want to get at is at the bottom. And you insert the pins back in place and make sure that the reds all align with all the other reds and the black align with all the other black ones. I take a little bit of flux and I put it over the pin that I have now produce, uh, uh, going through the board. <clears throat> protruding from the board, and that will allow the solder to stick as soon as I hit it with a good hot soldering iron. So once I've got it on there, I'll come in with a very hot soldering iron. you got to make it hot because beside getting the pin hot, you've got to get the hole that it is protruding through and the solder around the hole nice and hot. Um, some folks use a small soldering iron. I like to use my big weller, and I know chat rooms are going to go nuts going, oh, my God, you're going to put a huge blob and you're going to short out everything. After a while, using the soldering gun, you, one can get pretty good, and I'm pretty darn good at just soldering what needs to be soldered. And I put a big blob of solder on there, as you can see, and then I'm going to cut off the uh, protruding lead. Now, caution. Anytime you're using wire diagonals like we see here, when you cut that lead off, it's going to go out like a shot and it's going to go right into your eyeball if you're down there looking carefully. So for heaven's sake, never, ever, ever cut off a little bit of uh, hard wire that's going to become a projectile and hopefully not into your face. So be cautious and line up what you're going to do. Put your hand over it and then go ahead and do click and it'll be set. So now that we finished, we got a big solder blob, and now we've got to work on the right-hand uh, terminals as well. As you can see, they've got a blob there, but the pin has simply wiggled loose. So anytime you see open spots like that, it's because it's missing the pin. As long as you're at it, <clears throat> give those uh, connectors to the power input. If they're connected with big bolts like this, make sure they're nice and tight so that it's not going to wiggle loose. And you're going to have great success with your Anderson connector box. And again, I've done a ton of repairs on Anderson connector boxes, but the only ones I've never worked on is West Mountain Radio. And uh, they seem to have uh, everything so well uh, anchored uh, that we have yet to uh, break one out. And it's not just one manufacturer. It's anything where they go into the circuit board and you're constantly pulling up on it, it's ultimately going to break off the board. But all you got to do is undo the screws, get to the back, and you should be able to uh, uh, easily re-solder uh, the pins that have been pulled out from the circuit board. Um, one other note, uh, for those of you that have um, uh, a DMR um, uh, set up at your house, 
Uh, be cautious that you don't have it on 435.350, uh, a hot spot, uh, because these hot spots um, are creating interference to AO92. Uh, 435.350 is right in the middle of the satellite uplink band. So those of you with hot spots, even though they're only running maybe 50 milliwatts, it's still enough that could jam the satellite input frequency. So <clears throat> watch out for the satellite subbands because uh, there's a lot of activity going on on satellites that you want to be able to hear and communicate through. So, George, I hope they're using like an ICOM radio to make those satellite contacts as we do here. So, George, what have you got from ICOM America and what have you got, George, for all of your great soldering with a little bit of smoke? George? Well, thanks, Gordo. And, you know, I picked up a few little things at Huntsville this this um, couple of weeks ago at the Ham Fest. One of the things I got, though, was this little QRP dummy load right here. That's an interesting little kit. So let's take a look at that. Today on Smoking Solder, we're going to melt a little solder and build this new little kit that I picked up when I was at the Huntsville Ham Fest a couple of weeks ago. This came from Rocket City 3D, located right in Huntsville. They are a commercial 3D printing company. They had these little 20-watt QRP dummy load kits available there. Their website is rocketcity3d.com. I didn't find them on there, so you may need to reach out to them if you'd like one of these yourself. I believe they make them for clubs and different events, and it's a great little kit to get started soldering. And, you know, a little dummy load is something that everyone could use. Let's see what's in here. As we might expect, there is a 3D printed case to house the dummy load. Nice looking little case, simple enough, and it'll keep you from burning your fingers on those resistors. Let's see what else we got. Well, we got screws, which I had already removed from the case. A little bag of parts here. We've got a nice looking double-sided printed circuit board, complete with solder mask and silk screen to make it easy to know where the components go. And we've got well, a female BNC connector, which will be the input to the dummy load. We've got an LED. I haven't really seen those in dummy loads before, so we'll see where that goes. We've got a little diode. We've got a 10K ohm resistor. And we've got a little 0.01 microfarad capacitor. Eight 100 ohm, 3 watt resistors. Let's get started mounting all this stuff on the board and check it out. The first part they suggest you mount is the BNC connector. It goes on the same side of the board that the Rocket City 3D logo is on. And here's a trick that I have not thought about before and really hadn't seen anybody suggest. Take a piece of tape and tape the component down to the board. Then when you turn it over to solder it, it's not going to fall off. Now, since there's a lot of metal on this connector, I can make things go a little bit quicker by using a flux pin here and just kind of getting a little flux on there because that heat is going to dissipate pretty fast from my soldering iron. Now, I did turn up the heat all the way on my soldering iron because it takes a lot of heat to get these outer pins to flow. The next thing they suggest you solder are the load resistors. Boy, that is hot. <laughs> Let that cool off a little bit. Now, I'm going to do one side of the board first because if I put the other resistors in now, it's just going to make it tougher to get the soldering iron in there. You skip every other hole on here so that the resistors aren't actually side by side. Every other resistor is on the opposite side of the board. The diode here has a black ring on one side. You want to make sure that you get that properly polarized. When you look at the board here where D1 goes, 
you'll see a little line on the board that indicates that's the direction it goes. And we'll solder these three in first before we put the LED on. And then inspect it to make sure that you don't have any solder bridges, which we obviously don't, and that you've got enough solder on each of the pads there so the components are going to make good connection. And it looks like they are. Now we need to put in the LED. Now there's a flat side on this LED here. It's polarized as well because it is a diode. So the flat side lines up with the flat side marked on the board. Now how far down in the board do we want to stick that? Well, let's find out. That looks like a good height right there where it just comes through. And that's just slightly over level with the top, so that should be fine there. Well, that's it. It's finished now. Let's go ahead and test it before we put it inside the case. That shouldn't take very long. I'm going to need an adapter to convert from that female BNC to a type N connector to fit the antenna analyzer I'm going to use. Have you seen these at the Hamfest before? These RF adapter kits here. Now, I have plenty of adapters already assembled, but this allows you to take uh, just about any type of connector you want. Use these little pieces here to fit them in the middle between each piece. And then pick out whatever you want on the other side. And make up any connector you want right on the spot. I don't use this a lot, but when I need something like this, it's unusual or I just need one more adapter, this is a good way to come up with it. So there we go. I've got a male BNC to a male type N, which is one I did not have already. To test this, I'm going to use a Rig Expert AA230 Zoom Analyzer. This came from DX Engineering several years back. I believe they still make this model. Plug the dummy load in the top there, and we're ready to do some testing. I don't think I'm going to get enough signal out of this antenna analyzer to actually light that LED, so don't count on that. I'll try that later with uh, actual rig. Well, let's do an SWR chart. This is going to do it at 52 megahertz. It's going to sweep 200 kilohertz wide. Let's see what it looks like up there. Probably about a 1.1 to 1. So that looks very good. Let's just do a couple of other quick tests here. Let's do an RX chart just to see what the reactants and resistance look like. And... The reactance there is just a hair over the zero line. The resistance is just right on the 50 ohm line there. So you really couldn't ask for that to be any better. Now this is at 52 megahertz. Let's change our frequency range. Go on up a little bit higher and see what we've got. Let's see. Let's try 145 megahertz. See what it looks like there. That'll be more of a challenge. That looks around 1.3 to 1. Uh, let's, let's do an SWR meter and see what that says. 1.31 to 1. So all that tests out great. I, I'm sure it's going to be fine on the lower frequencies. We'll just... Uh, oh... We'll just try out an AM frequency in there, uh, the 75-meter band. Yeah, 
It's even better down at the lower frequencies, which is what you would expect. I just happened to have this Zygu rig on loan for a few weeks. Sitting over here on the bench, I decided I would plug it in and try it and see if it would like to dummy load. It's the only QRP rig I've got here in the shack, and it works. Of course, you could turn down any rig to less than 20 watts, and you'd be okay. So there you go, the Rocket City 3D QRP dummy load. A nice little kit to get you started soldering, and it's a useful accessory. And at 15 bucks, you know, that's that's a pretty good deal. It gives you a 20-watt dummy load. And the little LED, that's, as I mentioned, the first time I've seen one of those in a dummy load before. And, you know, that's kind of handy for two reasons. One, it lets you see that there's actually power there. And two, if you're trying to tune up a QRP rig, you get a little indication right here as to, you know, what kind of power is coming out. Now, you, of course, it's a dummy load. You won't have this hooked up when you're tuning an antenna. But, um, you know, I can see a, a lot of uh, good, good little handy um, ideas for having that on there. 20 watts, 15 bucks. I, I say it's a buy. I built this in probably, I don't know, I was videoing, so it took a little longer. It took me about 30 minutes, and I've soldered a lot. So someone just getting started, they could do one of these fairly quick, and it's a good exercise in soldering. Uh, the hardest part is going to be, you know, soldering on this uh, BNC connector right here because the outer pins on that PC board for it. That's all attached to this large metal surface here, so you have to get that a little hotter. The rest of it soldered just fine. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment because I've got uh, to talk about something we just gave away and something we're going to give away. But first, let's get a message from ICOM. Heard it, worked it, logged it. It's time to get the transceiver that's best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products. Make the most out of contest season with one of these ICOMs today. IC7610, the SDR every ham watts. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest of signals, even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling, software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of a SDR transceiver. RF direct sampling, 110 RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. Or get the IC7300. Changing the way entry-level HF is designed, this high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design will far exceed your expectations. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Keep your competitive edge with faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. ICOM's IC7851 is the pinnacle of HF perfection. Dual receivers, digital IF filters, memory keyer, digital voice recorder, high-resolution spectrum waterfall display, enhanced PC connectivity, and SD memory card slot. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. And as we were announcing all of this month, we were giving away the ICOM ID51A plus 2. Well, we've got a winner on that uh, we announced today. William KA2OFM is a proud winner of the ID51A plus 2 VHF, UHF, dual band, dual watch, portable D-Star unit. Uh, congratulations, William. You're going to like that radio. That's, uh, well, I have an ID-51 myself, and I think uh, Don does and Gordo does. We, that is one of the most liked handhelds here, and a, and a premium handheld at that. Very nice. So you'll really enjoy that. But fear not, we've got more to give away in September ICOM is giving away the ICOM ID5100A dual band dual watch mobile. It's a, got built in GPS, touchscreen operation, DVD dual watch, 
DVFM repeater list function, SD memory card slot for voice and data storage. There's an available U2133 Bluetooth module, and there's downloadable Bluetooth and Android apps available. A great mobile rig there. That's uh, the one I have in my truck. I really like it, the ID5100A. You're going to like it, too. If you want to win that, well, here's what you need to do. After this and each episode of Ham Nation, go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation. There you can register, and you'll be entered in the weekly drawings each time you enter for some of the weekly prizes, swag prizes, T-shirts, hats, etc. They generally have uh, more than one winner on that every week, but you'll also be entered in the grand prize drawing for that new radio each month, and uh, who wouldn't want to win that ID 5100A? Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this episode and every episode of Ham Nation and sign up to win. Good luck. Don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And I want to mention, you saw what I was building right there. Randy wants to know what you've been building. Send your photos and a description, no videos, please, to hamprojects at twit.tv and your project could be shown in an upcoming Show Us Your Projects episode right here on Ham Nation and Smoke and Solder. Send those to Randy, Ham Projects at twit.tv. And now, Bob, that's what I've been doing this week. Uh, what have you been doing? Um, I've been reading Electric Radio, which is if you don't subscribe to Electric Radio, you should. It's a great magazine. I opened it up. Look what the lead article is. Another version of the pine board. I'm going, what? So I contacted <laughs> Bill Steele. Everybody pay attention. You will not believe what this wonderful builder did with the pine board. This is the same circuit all of us built on wood. Look what Bill did. We've got several pictures. Look at this. It's looked like something you bought from, from DX Engineering. It's a beautiful, beautiful build. The next, uh, that's the front panel. And uh, there it is in its uh, infancy as he started building. Did all of the metal work. How beautiful, Bill. This is great. And uh, uh, silk screen, that's all done. And then he started putting it together. And uh, the wiring is follows exactly what we all did on pine board, but he did it in metal. And of course he had uh, punches, greenly punches, but what a beautiful job. And there is kind of the finished unit. You can see that same coil. Remember that 40 and 80 meter coil, but he band switched it. And uh, the, the, the circuit he added uh, the meters to it. He's got cathode meters so he can Look at that, plus the RF out, the cathode, uh, metering the cathode will tell you what the uh, current on the final is. That's how you tune it up. And uh, the next slide shows you a really nice picture of it, pretty much finished and uh, without the uh, outer cabinet. This comes from a company called Hammond. Do not, <laughs> do not uh, think about Hammond, Oregon. It's Hammond in Canada that builds these chassis. You can buy chassis from them. Like you see that back panel that has the uh, fins on it, all that. You have to punch your own holes, but uh, you can buy the raw chassis and just beautiful cabinets. What a great build. But look what he did with it, everybody, please. Well, that is very nice. Isn't that gorgeous? I think Bob dropped out again. Apparently, he's forgotten to feed the chipmunk uh, driving his charter internet. That is gorgeous. Let's keep going through these pictures, uh, if you have these, Vic, because these are absolutely fabulous. Uh, I had not seen this. That's the last one. Oh, that's the last one. Those are gorgeous. Look at the workmanship on that. And it all started from, from Bob's pine board. That's just absolutely amazing. Mm-mm-mm. Wow. That is cool. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Well, I, yeah, we don't know what's wrong with Bob's internet. He's been popping in and out all night. 
Um, I know he wanted to mention um, some things about the AM window, something that, that he is very, very passionate about. So uh, let's bring that up uh, while we're at it right now. Um, uh, if you see the frequency chart, uh, it, typically the AM windows are not included on there, which is something that, that you know, Bob is really passionate about, the, uh, the gentleman's agreement there. So uh, let's all remember, if you, if you just go online to Google and just, uh, you know, type in, ham radio am windows you'll see exactly where those am windows are and uh, those frequencies are by gentlemen's agreement kind of reserved for guys uh, who want to sit back and do the old ancient modulation the amplitude modulation so uh, you know if you're a sideband guy kind of you know give a wide berth away from those and let the am guys have their fun uh, got plenty of spectrum for sideband and everything else but uh, the AM, uh, the AM frequencies, just a, just a, a few of them there. So there, you can see the AM frequencies. So uh, if you're a sideband guy or a digital guy or or slow scan TV guy, uh, stay away from from those AM frequencies. And uh, uh, conversely, uh, you know, you stay away from the slow scan uh, frequencies and let uh, the slow scan guys have their little little chunk of the spectrum. And uh, just uh, let's all go back to being gentlemanly with the gentleman's agreement. And uh, and we'll all get along just fine because we uh, we have a good amount of spectrum uh, throughout all of the various bands and everything. So if we uh, if we all honor those gentlemen's agreements, it's going to make operating things just a whole lot better. And that's at uh, a r r l dot org slash a m dash frequencies. Right. So exactly. real easy. Right there on the yeah yeah real easy. We're going to make a ham of you yet, Victor. One of these days, boy. One of these days, we're gonna, we're gonna days. con you into gonna con you into it. You know, we conned. Uh, well, I shouldn't say conned. I mean, she wanted to. Dr. Tamitha Scove got her amateur radio license uh, some time ago, and uh, she continues to uh, hang out with us and tell us about the solar weather. And we're gonna hear from Dr. Scove right after we tell you this uh, from the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 2,182, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, August 28, 2019. With a planned crash onto the surface of the moon, China's microsatellite has ended its lunar mission. The 14-month journey of China's microsatellite, Longzhang-2, ended July 31 with its intended crash onto the lunar surface. It spent 437 days in lunar orbit, studying solar radiation and conducting radio astronomical observations. While it was in orbit, amateur radio operators had partnered with scientists at China's Harbin Institute of Technology to uplink commands to the tiny craft and receive data the satellite was transmitting. One of the images it captured was of the moon and earth during the total solar eclipse on July 2nd of this year. The final commands given to the satellite came from Reinhard Kuhn, DK5LA, whose ongoing work with Longzhang 2 since its launch in May 2018 made him the first radio amateur to communicate with a satellite in lunar orbit. His greatest challenge may have come on the day the tiny craft was set to end its journey. A nearby lightning strike prompted him to unplug all his cables, but he needed to reconnect a bit later, and he did, just before the tiny satellite passed behind the moon. Scientists believe 12 minutes after it went silent, it hit the lunar surface. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Graham Kemp, VK4BB. Keeping an eye to the sky and an ear to the atmosphere, AMSAT has a big event coming up just for you. October may seem a long way off, but if you're planning to attend the 50th anniversary AMSAT Space Symposium and General Meeting, it's closer than you realize. Tickets have gone on sale for the symposium, the banquet, and the Sunday bus tour. AMSAT recently announced its panel of speakers for the banquet to be held on Saturday, October 19th. The panel will take on the topic of the foundations of AMSAT. They include AMSAT's founding president, Perry Klein, W3PK, Project Oscars' Lance Jenner, K6GSJ, author and diplomat George Jacobs, W3ASK, along with several others. The symposium weekend will be held in Arlington, Virginia from the 18th to the 20th of October and will include a side trip to the Stephen F. udvar Hazy Center at the National Air and Space Museum. For details and registration information, visit amsat.org. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Dameron, N8TMW. When the Radio Society of Great Britain hosts its convention later this year, it will have something special on the menu. 
Just as there are menu choices at the gala dinner at the Radio Society of Great Britain's convention in October, the weekend also offers a menu choice that's an alternative to the dinner itself. Convention organisers are hosting a build-a-thon on the Saturday evening, the 12th of October, and participating hams will get an SMD Sudden 2, which is a 40-metre direct conversion receiver by Kanga Products UK. Those who attend won't just be building new skills, but will get this new piece of equipment to add to their shack. The Bath Buildathon team will be there to provide guidance in different techniques for surface mount work. And lest anyone should think that all that hard work means going hungry while well, the dinner gets underway elsewhere at Kent Hill Park, Milton Keynes, there'll also be a hot and cold buffet. So in between working with all those electronic components, hams will be able to choose among the culinary components and build their own dinner too. For more details about the convention, visit the webpage of the RSG rsgb.org forward slash convention. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Boot, G4NJH. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Graham Kemp, VK4BB, Jim Dameron, N8TMW, Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the News Desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. Space weather this week definitely picks up a bit. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see there are two coronal holes in Earth view. The first of them is going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone here over the next day or so, and it should bring aurora to high latitudes, and it only lasts about a day, and that's about it. But then we have this second coronal hole, and that's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone starting around the beginning of September. This coronal hole, the last time we saw it, one rotation ago, gave us solar storm conditions and brought aurora deep down into mid-latitudes, and it could do the same thing again. As we switch to our backside sun, you can see that coronal hole as it's rotating into Earth view off of Stereo's west limb. But if you look behind that, there really isn't all that much going on. So once again, the sun is continuing to be a spotless sun. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you're not, not loving life very much, but you GPS users, your reception is absolutely spectacular. For more details on this week's space weather, including when and where to see Aurora, how your GPS reception and emergency radio should fare, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Little quickie from Dr. T this week, and we thank her, of course, for everything that she does for us. She's a great follow on Twitter. You really should. At Tamitha Scove, all one word, and uh, check her out at spaceweatherwoman.com. And also, she has a YouTube channel. Uh, just she's constantly putting new information up there and uh, such a great resource for those of us in the hobby uh, to know what's going on on our nearest star. And it intimately affects what we do down here on Earth with our amateur radio uh, endeavors. So there you go. Up next, we're going to talk to the Pearson family who we met at Huntsville, Alabama. They were the grand prize winners of the ICOM 7610. It's a great story. If you haven't heard about it, we'll tell you all about that. And we'll introduce you to this uh, really cool family of hams. Right after we uh, hear this from DX Engineering. Whether you're out on the field or you're storing your gear for the winter, you got to protect your investment. And DX Engineering gives you ruggedly built and versatile equipment cases from Nanook, iPortable, and Gator. The Nanook cases are really, really cool. These things are, I love these things. They offer an excellent way to move and store your valuable radio equipment with confidence. These are cases, the Nanooks, have been tested to withstand scorching desert heat and frigid Arctic blasts. They meet strict military standards to be lightweight and virtually indestructible. The cases feature an exclusive power claw latch, and that ensures that the lids stay closed. You can keep your antenna analyzer, like George uh, used earlier in his smoke and solder segment, safe with a Nanook and analyzer combo with sectioned foam made to fit specific rig expert and comet antenna analyzers. Very cool. The Nanook cases come in a huge range of sizes and styles and colors. Find the one perfect for you at dxengineering.com. You can simplify your portable operations with Pro 2 equipment racks from iPortable. The Pro 2 rack system combines a rugged travel slash flight case with a DC power distribution point speaker and rack shelving. Plenty of room for you to include a radio or two plus a power supply and tuner so you can roll your own. Go kit. The front panel contains volume control, coax plugs, 
fuse panel, USB ports, power poles, and a headphone jack, and they're compatible with virtually any radio setup. Just use your imagination and uh, go nuts. Available in four or six rack units. And then Gator case equipment uh, rack cases are our smart choice for safely transporting or storing your gear. They're made from virtually indestructible molded polyethylene. They're ideal for housing radios, power supplies, tuners, whatever you include in your emergency go kit. They feature recessed steel butterfly twist latches that keep the removable front and rear lids secure. These cases are available at a rack heights of four to six units with depths of either 14 and a quarter or 19 inches. And DX Engineering also carries extra panels, shelves, and hardware so you can customize your case. DX Engineering ships faster than anyone else in the industry. Most orders placed by 10 p.m. Eastern are shipped the same day. With proven products and expert advice, DX Engineering is helping you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And we thank DX Engineering for their support of Ham Nation. Now, it is my incredible, just I'm, I'm delighted to introduce to you a really, a really cool family. Something happened that was amazing at the Huntsville Ham Fest that I've never seen in my almost 25 years as a ham. And Bob Heil has been a ham since the 50s, and he's never seen this. And practically everybody who was at the Huntsville Ham Fest, who works with the Ham Fest, uh, Mark Brown, N4 BCD, the Ham Fest chairman, says he's never seen it. At the grand prize drawing on Saturday, the grand prize was an ICOM 7610. Normally, when they call out the call sign of the person who won, and then you hear that excited hoot and holler from back in the back, you hear grumbling of people throwing their tickets away and, oh, man, I missed the radio. Well, when they called out KN4VKW, uh, bring them up, uh, Vic, bring up the, 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 the family. There, there it is right there, a 10-year-old. Ryan, v, uh, KN4 VKW went running up, and the whole room erupted in applause and cheering. It was the most amazing thing. And the whole family was standing up on stage with that, that ICOM 7610, and the paparazzi of people taking pictures was probably, I don't know, five or six deep. I've never seen it happen. And so it's just the coolest thing. So let me introduce to you uh, this great family. They're the Pearsons. We have um, we have Andrew. He's the dad. KN4 VKX, and then uh, Andrew. Why don't you go ahead and, and introduce your lovely family to us, and we'll uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about what happened at Huntsville. All right, appreciate it. This is my son, our son Blake. He's 11. KN4 VKY, uh, and then of course Ryan, as you introduced, and my lovely wife Jacqueline. Very good. Now, you heard you heard the grumbling at the ham fest of, uh, oh, man, some kid won the radio. It's probably not even a ham. And there's been grumblings on on some of the HF frequencies as well. As, oh, did you see some 10-year-old kid won a $3,000 radio? It's probably not even a ham. Uh, Andrew, tell us what license classes you guys hold. Uh, I am honored to share with you that the three of us are generals. We uh, studied together, we passed our tests together, and we are here as generals uh, tonight. And you're you're also and, brand new hams, as I as I recall. You got your the three of you got your technician class licenses in June, and then you all three upgraded together to general in July. So this is a brand new ham family, and I'm sure Jacqueline is is probably not far behind. Just the peer pressure alone. I've got to imagine is is uh, is pretty is, is 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 pretty undeniable, but the fact that you guys are brand new hams, you're you're you know, tr like all of us, trying to put a station together on a budget, and uh, all of a sudden you have this windfall of winning this ICOM seventy six ten, and the fact that uh, that it was your son Ryan's ticket that won is is just so cool, and uh, I got to tell you, I was standing up front, and when I saw Ryan run up there, I'm like. Holy crap, that's Ryan. And then I'm standing up there next next to Jacqueline, and the three of you are up on stage, and I told her, I said, get your butt up there with your family. What are you doing down here? She's like, oh, I almost forgot. So it was such a cool moment. And uh, I, anyway, so tell us tell us what was going through through your minds when when you heard that, that ticket being called. Go ahead, Ryan. Okay, so when I heard that ticket called, I heard, honestly, I said this in my brain. When I heard Ryan, I'm like, okay, Odds of winning very slim. Then I also said, okay, just listen still. You still have a chance. Then I hear Ryan, okay, that limits to like 10 people. And then I hear KN4. And I'm like, there's probably only one Ryan that's KN4. And then I hear VKW. And I'm like, 
Oh my goodness. I was like, <laughs> cannot believe it still. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. I mean, I've uh, one of the very first ham fests I went to, I went on HF radio and, you know, I was considerably older than you, but still a new ham. And yeah, that's, it's the most amazing feeling to, to finally, you know, hear your, your name and call sign being called. And especially for, for, a, you know, a cutting edge radio, like the 7610, that's, that's going to be the centerpiece of a great, of a great station you guys are, are putting together. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, about how you all studied together and what brought you into the amateur radio hobby. Because, you know, it's, I mean, you're, you're all young. Everyone thinks, wrongly, of course, that, that you know, ham radio is an old man's hobby or old man's uh, pursuit. And, of course, it certainly is not. And, uh, I mean, I'm close to that with the Young Ham of the Year Award, which is the light of my life. And to see uh, a young family and, uh, you know, kids 10 and 11 who are obviously passionate about this hobby. What was it that, that drew you all to the amateur radio hobby? Because it's, it's a fascinating story. Well, when I was in high school, um, I was around some hams and, and they introduced me to it. And I definitely uh, get, got bit by the bug at that point. Um, I ended up studying, I passed the written on my novice, but I had a cassette tape. I was a teenager playing sports, high school life. Uh, I didn't pass the CW portion. Um, but I bit by the bug back then. A year ago, we went up to the Experimental Aircraft Association, EAA, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and we were at the Kid Venture area so that the boys could participate in an amazing uh, kid complex of activities. And as we were walking around, uh, there was this, this old shack of a building, and uh, I walked in there, and uh, there were some hams in there, and it turned out to be a ham shack of about 60 years back that they've uh, kept in, in great shape and they've now taken up to EAA. And it was just really cool walking in there, seeing old equipment, um, old uh, notes, and just being in that environment and talking with those guys, I was rebit by that bug. And so uh, because of having a previous uh, uh, eye opening to the ham world, when we got back from EAA, um, I happened to look up Hamfest, trying to find something that was near because I just was excited at that point again. And we found Huntsville. So a year ago, we went down to Huntsville. Um, it was actually uh, these two boys and our oldest son, who's in college for engineering. And so it was great. It was dad with the boys down in Huntsville at Hamfest. And uh, we went to the kid area so that these guys could. Uh, enjoying the activities in Huntsville, and there's this amazing woman named Carol Poole who spent a ton, or sorry, Car uh, Carol Perry, pardon me, um, that spent a uh, ton of time uh, talking with us, encouraging us, and getting us absolutely excited. And, and she said, you guys can absolutely do this and keep studying until you get your generals. And so uh, after we left Huntsville last year, told the boys, I'm like, hey, here's the deal. We get done with school next summer, we are going to start studying and we are going to become hams. And uh, they were all in. And uh, so we get done with school this year and? Um, we uh, looked up hand test online and we decided that we'd do it online instead of in the books because we thought it would help better because um, hand test online make sure that you know that you know um, all the questions and so we worked into our day uh, learning that for about two to four hours every day and we studied and studied and then we got to the point where uh, we looked up a place to take the test and we uh, took our technician and while we were there, we decided to take our general to see what we were going to do next. Um, and then we saw what we were up against, so we all decided that we were going to do our generals. And how did, then what did we do again? This year we went to the ham. No, 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 I mean, uh, when we got done with the tech, we decided we were going to do the general, so what did we do again? What? We ended up getting back in front of the computer. It's studying for weeks and hours. Yeah, uh, we did the same thing on ham test online. Uh, studied, studied, and took our general. 
Okay, that's that is such a cool story, and and I'm I'm just tickled to know you guys. I want to talk to Jacqueline though, because Jacqueline, you're kind of looking at this kind of uh, from the. I mean, you're you're on the inside of it, obviously, because you're your mom and, 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 and everything else, but still you're kind of on the outside looking into this ham radio thing in a certain way. So what's your impression of all this? All right. So my impression has been, I was at EAA with everybody. I was in the same ham shack. The ham shack there was actually from an area where I had grown up in as a girl. So it was very interesting. Um, but I guess to fast forward it, um, I can tell you my eyes have been very opened to the, there's so many people who are still very active in ham radio. And yes, the stereotype of it being your older, older male kind of um, event, but I'm telling you, I'm, I'm very grateful for, um, you know, we all like to, or I'm still of a generation that loves to learn from the generations before me. So um, at uh, WCARES in Williamson County, the group that the boys are a part of, uh, an amazing group of men and women that are pouring their knowledge into my kids. And uh, the idea that then my kids can be a part of the future of ham radio and being able to have another generation carry this on is incredibly important. And I work in an emergency um, type environment so um, emergency communications is something that I'm very passionate about as well. So I'm very excited for them all. Very good. Well, I have no doubt that it's just a, a matter of time before you get your license, and I'm sure it will be uh, sooner rather than later. Well, you've got this box in front of you that, as of yet, has not been opened. You've been waiting. We tried to get you on uh, last week, but we had Skype issues. You wanted to actually wait until you were here with us on Ham Nation to unbox that 7610. So I think this is going to be probably one of the more exciting unboxing uh, events I've ever seen in my life. So go ahead, guys, tear into that thing. Let's let's get that 7610 out and and, and look at it. Here we go, Ryan. Get this. Be careful now. Don't. Excitement has not uh, been lost from us at all. It's been killing us not opening this box. So we are super excited to be doing this now. Oh, I bet. I'd have had it open in the car. I don't know about you. I, I wouldn't have been. I'd have had it open in the car. <laughs> this is exciting. Oh, boy. A brand new family of hams unboxing a brand new Icom 7610 that they won at a ham fest. What could be better? Yeah, you got to get the packing information. There's the uh, the book. There's your got to have a microphone in there, probably. Oh, look at that. So, cool. all right, I got the bag, please. That's it. There you go. There it is. The brand new Icom 7610, the Pearson Station. Look at that. For, for everyone, uh, that was interested about, oh, dad's going to take the radio. I tell you what, my wife and I, we have poured our lives into uh, everything we can do for our kids. And we couldn't be more proud that we have this for them. Will I be excited to use it? Absolutely. But um, anything for our kids. And um, we are so grateful. And I just want to say thanks to uh, Ham Radio Outlet, uh, the Huntsville Ham Fest, Ray Novak, Tom Medlin, of course, you, Don, and everyone at Ham Nation for all of your uh, contributions and capturing this memory for us. We are very grateful. Yeah, I just saw in the in the chat room, uh, K2LF, Dave, just asked, where's the power supply? Do you guys have a power supply for that thing? <laughs> well, we have uh, a friend of ours from our uh, WCARES group, and uh, he's here making sure that everything technically is uh good so that we can be online with you and he does have a power supply we just didn't know good. if there's enough time for us to get it fired up with you no i just want to no i don't we don't need to fire it up tonight i just want to make sure that you have a power supply so you guys can can actually and an antenna to actually put the pearson station on the air and that's what i'm going to call it because it's it's not your radio it's not ryan's radio it's not blake's radio it's not jacqueline's radio it's the pearson's radio absolutely <laughs> And that's the cool. Let's get let's get George in because George was there at Huntsville and he experienced the same thing that we did when when you guys won. George, uh, you guys won. George what have you got to say for the Pearsons here? 
Well, I got to say, I'm very proud to see them win. You know, I was actually doing an interview with someone at that time. And anytime they come over the, you know, the loudspeakers there, I, I just stop recording so I can listen and see what's going on. I knew they were drawing the grand prize and that Joe Eisenberg always buys like 100 tickets and stamps his name on them. I was waiting for them to say Joe Eisenberg, but no, uh, they didn't. So uh, congratulations, uh, especially in this particular case, because uh, you were radio shopping, and I don't think you could have come away with a better deal. Wow, that is terrific. And you know... Kids and mom and dad, the real learning of ham radio begins now with that radio. So even you don't have to transmit immediately until you get the right antenna. What the heck? Stick in some wire, put it over uh, the roof, and start listening to all the excitement. And then shortly, you'll come up with a balanced antenna system for HF and you will be on the air. Congratulations, all of the family. All right, Gordon, I have a question for you. You've obviously been a ham for a long time and been to hundreds, if not thousands, probably or tens of thousands of ham fests and conventions around. Have you ever heard the assembled throngs cheer when they did not win a $3,000 HF radio? <laughs> no, you know, I never have, Don. No. So that'll be a first for uh, everyone to see that the future of ham radio are certainly in kids, and all I can say is winner, winner, winner. Absolutely. Well, Pearson family, we could not be more happy and more proud, and we couldn't be any more delighted. And uh, I know Bob Heil, his his internet crapped out, and he would he would be right here as well, cheering you guys on. But uh, listen, you uh, you guys are are part of a, a huge global fraternity now and family. Uh, of common interests and 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 the thing about ham radio is there's a niche for everybody so no matter what each of you individually want to do uh, you can do it and you've got a great radio right there cutting edge uh, hf radio that icom 7610 uh, that's going to be the centerpiece of a really cool radio station and we just could not be happier for you and more proud of you and uh, you guys are going to be i know great representatives to the hobby so from all of us here and, and from everybody watching as well uh congratulations we have uh, people in the chat room saying congratulations uh, our friend dudley who introduced me to you he told me to tell you guys hello he's watching in the chat room so hello from dudley um we'll uh, we'll have you guys on again uh, i think uh, if if you guys do something cool or, or we'll follow your your story and uh, uh we'd be more than more than pleased to have you guys on periodically and let us know how your ham radio journey is going how's that sound we'd be honored well hopefully the next time it'll be four hams sitting there in red icom shirts no pressure jacqueline i'm not trying to pressure you or anything i'm just i'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted i'm i'm living vicariously through you guys and it's just i remember i'm i'm as excited about about you guys as i was when my son tyler got his ticket a couple of years ago uh literally it's it's uh i'm, I'm just i'm so thrilled we we're, we all are and uh uh, best of luck in your in your ham radio endeavors and uh, get that thing on the air as soon as you can, okay? We're, work, we're absolutely working on it. Good deal. All right. Well, thanks for being here and uh, and and we'll we'll talk to you guys later. Uh, Amanda is uh, out doing some public service stuff tonight, I do believe. Uh, and so she is not available with us to be watching the chat room, but I do have some uh, net information. I have not seen where the HF nets are. I know that there is no uh, 40 or 20 meter net tonight, but I have not seen uh, where the uh, 40 meter or 80 meter nets are, but they're probably in and around the normal locations, which are 7192 and 3906. D-Star net, the after show net, of course, is on 14 Charlie. The DMR net is on 31012. And uh, Echo Link, I think we're still doing Echo Link. That is on Do Drop In 355800. That is uh, active. I was on there earlier tonight listening to another net. So, uh, uh, check all of our after show nets tonight. And uh, yeah, 7192, I believe is, uh, yep, 40 meters on 7192. So uh, George, any final words? George and Gordon, any final words for us tonight? George, go ahead. Well, uh, Don, yeah, uh, Friday night, 
Uh, myself, Professor Thomas, and uh, my partner, Dean Martin, will be doing the next Ham College over at live.amateurlogic.tv. Uh, join us over there if you're looking for a good time this Friday night at 8 Central or 100 UTC. Other than that, uh, no, I don't know what I'm going to be doing next week. I've got to look in the old uh, parts bin there, see if I can come up with anything uh, interesting to talk about next week. But uh, and hopefully, well, hopefully the weather's not going to get too bad with uh, a hurricane approaching Florida down there. See you next week. Yeah. Gordo? Um, my big comment is, again, we need more kids in ham radio. And check your connections. If you got a loose one of these and you pull it out and the whole thing pops out, don't fret. Simply open up the back. Get out your soldering iron and fix the two points that have pulled off the circuit board. Everybody have a great long weekend, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Don, back to you for your final. Before we go, we've got that uh, active uh, storm out there that's uh, going to become a hurricane. Gordon, remind us of the hurricane watch net frequencies. Certainly a 14.325 during the days, 72.68. And I'm going to tune it in right now on my ICOM, 72.68 uh, for this evening. And we just wish everyone the best. It looks like it's going to go on the outside and uh, really affect uh, one side of the uh, Florida coast. So we wish everyone the best this weekend. Yeah, and uh, Puerto Rico, unfortunately, is going to be taking a direct hit, and uh, they're still in the uh, in the rebuilding uh, phase from two years ago when when they got absolutely raked. This storm is not going to be anything like that one, but still, um, those island nations they they can't take a lot of water, and Puerto Rico is still rebuilding. So our hearts go out to everyone down there in Puerto Rico, batting down the hatches, and uh, everybody else along uh, the Florida coast. And we'll keep an eye on it, and we uh, suggest you do too, even though even even though you may live inland or out on the West Coast. Keep an eye on it and uh, listen to those hurricane uh, frequencies. So for uh, everybody here that's uh, involved, uh, Bob and uh, everybody else, Amanda, who's not with us tonight, and of course, Victor back at uh, Twit Control, uh, we'll say thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your, your long three-day weekend. Hopefully you get one, and uh, stay safe. And we'll see you again here next Wednesday night on Ham Nation. Good night, everybody. <laughs>